It's yours, Shirley. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Eric Winfrey. Uh, Eric, please tell us about your living history. Okay, great. Um, let me see if I'm okay here. All right. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about sort of actually focus on on the early days of what pushed me in the direction that got me to where I am now. Um, I guess uh, primarily from uh, when I was young to when I um, just became a professor. So I'm going to uh, start by talking about uh, where I was born. Um, so I was, I was born actually in the University of Chicago uh, Hospital uh, in 1969 on more or less my father's first day as an assistant professor at the University of Chicago. And since many of the paths people take are crooked, I'll mention his, which is um, that as a PhD student at Princeton, he had a falling out with his uh, thesis advisor who refused to give him a PhD. Um, and nonetheless, uh, Jack Cowan, who is the um, uh, chair of theoretical biology at the University of Chicago, hired him anyways. Um, and so this is sort of the first example of um, how important it can be uh, to give young people a chance, even when their career perhaps is not by all signs stellar. Uh, they can become stellar later. Um, the other thing that I'll, I'll mention is uh, that my dad was at the University of Chicago only for a few years uh, before taking the family to a um, out of the big dangerous city to uh, a much nicer place, um, the cornfields of Indiana. Uh, so he moved to Purdue University actually, and I grew up around there um, wandering around in the cornfield, cornfields and cow pastures. Um, and that was a really important part of me um, really appreciating what the world has to offer in the sense of nature. I eventually got back to the University of Chicago, um, but again, not through the most direct path. Um, I had a bit of a... Uh, I guess, rebellious youth in high school, and my grades were awful, and I didn't get into any of the universities I applied to. Um, and so when it was time to go to uh, college and I got rejected, um, it was my math teacher in high school, John Benson, and uh, uh, who happened to know the chair of the math department at the University of Chicago, who sort of helped me get admitted, not as a proper student, but as a uh, so-called student at large uh, who could take classes. And this was a wonderful thing for me because I didn't have to take any of the requirements. I was just a student taking whatever classes you want. I wasn't in a degree program. Uh, and so I got to take philosophy and biology and geobiology and robotics, whatever it is I wanted, um, which was very stimulating and exciting rather than just sort of um, doing what was required of me. So I, I think that was actually a, a fortunate accident in my case. Um, most of my time I spent, um, again, not actually spending too much time on the classes. I got awful grades again. Instead, I had my own individual projects. I had programming projects, math projects. Um, I read papers on the side. Um, and I think those kinds of side projects were much more influential to me um, than any of the coursework or sort of top-down uh, mentoring that um, was available. And so I'm going to uh, say a few words about, I think, the two most influential things in making me who I am, which is reading an awful lot of books, um, really mostly in, in um, high school and college and graduate school, um, and having people to talk to and engage in um, meaningful discussions. Uh, 
so some of the earliest books that influenced me um, were things like Ernst Haeckel's um, really beautiful uh, sketches of what biology does. Um, and Dawkins' book on the selfish gene introducing me to sort of evolution and the the idea of, you know, um, the processes that make biology so beautiful, uh, which got me to asking questions like, you know, um, if evolution can create all, all these things by these kinds of simple processes, uh, was Greek mythology really so crazy or could such things exist um, also? Uh, and that sort of um, led to thinking about bioengineering in, in, in some forms. Also at the time I was learning about computers, uh, I was learning programming languages, uh, assembly language, these simple ways of describing how information can be used to do things. And so when, when you think about evolution and the information encoded in DNA and the information encoded in computers, I started to develop this sort of perspective that um, really they were talking about the same fundamental thing how information sort of organizes uh, machinery and controls machinery. Um, and of course, this isn't a new idea. Um, Schrodinger and others have sort of uh, uh, emphasized this point. I think it's, it's quite um, well accepted by some, but it's not clear always uh, in what form, how do you think about biological information? How do you think about biological algorithms? Um, it's not as cut and dry as computer algorithms and computer programming. So it was um, other work sort of along those times in artificial life, people who were interested in writing programs, assembly language uh, that maybe self reproduces itself in memory and uh, different programs try to um, copy themselves into memory, compete with each other when there's multiple running, uh, multiple programs running. Uh, make mutations, and in fact, evolve um, to the extent that you can, in these simulations, look at evolutionary trees of, um, of algorithms that are, that are changing and running in these simulated worlds. Um, so the, these were, to me, very uh, indirect but compelling comparisons between computing machinery and biological machinery. Um, I think I'll not go over all the books, but the, the sort of fundamental theme here was that uh, over and over again, computation was sort of the, the reason why things were as they were, uh, as my sort of high school and college mind could comprehend them. So the other uh, part I wanted to emphasize is the people that I talked to, um, friends, mentors, colleagues, uh, who really affected my intellectual growth. Um, you know, if you can have, uh, uh, be inspired by them, if they can teach you things, um, that was far more valuable than what I did in classroom. So I'm glad I didn't spend too much time in the classroom. And one in particular that uh, uh, really influenced my, my development was uh, Matt Cook, a high school friend who, um, when we were both in college, we exchanged uh, many long emails discussing neural networks and, and how minds might work and how computation might work. Um, and explaining things to him and having him explain things to me was really how I learned how to write, um, more so than any kind of academic aspect. After college, we both went and worked for Stephen Wolfram, sort of as a job between, for me, between college and uh, graduate school. Uh, this was a mixed bag in many ways. Um, but uh, also a very stimulating um, uh, stimulating experience. When I went to, uh, by the time I got to graduate school, um, I, I still didn't know what I wanted to do, although sort of biology and computation were the two pieces of the picture. But I ended up in Al Barr's group, who does computer graphics. This was sort of an accident. Uh, and it took me two years to figure out that computer graphics wasn't really what I wanted to do. Um, and fortunately, I was able to later join the group of John Hopfield, uh, which was a wonderful uh, group of, you know, very intellectually 
uh, stimulating people to be around and engage in ideas. Um, so Hopfield, of course, worked on neural networks as sort of a, a physics perspective on neural networks. Um, and I spent actually <laughs> two years in, in his group um, working on neural networks, building autonomous robots and doing nothing that um, other people wouldn't also have done. And so one of the things I guess I learned at that time was that if, if what I'm doing um, is something that other people would also do, maybe better, maybe worse, um, then I'm not really contributing much to science. I can contribute if I do something that nobody else would do. And I found that opportunity by accident when reading um, uh, a new paper that just came out by Len Adelman on DNA computing, which sort of merged my interests of information in biology, information in DNA, and how computation uh, relates to those kinds of basic molecular processes such as self-assembly. Um, that path brought me to uh, um, Ned Siemens' work on DNA nanotechnology, how you can program molecular self-assembly reactions, and uh, eventually brought me in contact with uh, Paul Rodemond, with whom um, we developed some theories about how algorithms can be carried out by self-assembly processes. And so that's more or less where I was when I started my um, uh, assistant professor job. Um, and I had the uh, good fortune of um, recruiting Paul as a postdoc, where in the laboratory, we sort of designed the first algorithmic self-assembly process using uh, these uh, engineered DNA molecules. So I think I'm over time, so I'm going to uh, just finish up and mention that one of the things that made a big difference in my graduate career was that John Hopfield sort of let me pursue these things that wasn't really his path of research. Um, and he supported me on that very independent endeavor and, and made me feel like that was the right way of running a lab as well. And so when Paul got interested in something that wasn't really my thing, um, I let him go off and explore that. Uh, and that was also a very productive thing for him. He wrote a single author paper uh, inventing uh, DNA origami. So um, we did some of these uh, uh, projects sort of combining information and algorithms at the sort of in self-assembly, but the larger picture that uh, I guess I'm thinking about now is how other kinds of processes that you see in biology can be thought of as uh, being algorithmic, uh, such as developmental programs that use information in the genome to create a structure. And if you take that seriously, you sort of have to ask if the molecular information and algorithms in cells or in engineered systems are they more like conventional computers? Are they more like neural networks? Uh, what's the right model for thinking about this kind of computation? And so that's more or less where I am now. Uh, it's an exciting place to be. I'm, I'm thrilled to be doing it. Um, and it's an open-ended thing. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop with this sort of point about um, being able to see basic principles in science, like what, what is an algorithm, sometimes you need to study it by engineering and building things uh, so that you're sort of familiar what, with what that object looks like um, so that you can see it in a very sort of confusing, cluttered environment such as uh, biology. Okay, I will stop there, thank you. Thank you, uh, Eric. I'm applauding on behalf of the audience. That was a fantastic talk. Um, start out with one question from the audience. Uh, on that slide with the picture of bar, was that one of the magic eye stereograms? That was the project that we did. So that was um, 
Um, it wasn't made by Magic Eye. That was made by um, myself and other people in Albar's group who uh, sort of hooked up that uh, um, the basic ideas of the psychophysics of Magic Eyes with their physics-based simulations. And we actually made a, uh, a short movie um, you know, not just a static image, but but a dynamic image that you can watch. That's a magic eye. So so you know, you cross your eyes, and 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 uh, a three dimensional structure pops up, but it's now a, a, a moving image. It was it was kind of fun. Oh, thank you. Very fun. Uh, I have uh, let's see. We have one other question. Uh, I'll pass it to Shree to ask this one. Oh, thank you, Charlie. Um... Thank you so much, Eric, for such a fantastic talk. Um, I can only ask one question, so I'll go with this one, uh, <laughs> um, which is that you highlighted in so many different contexts in your formative years, having the space to let your imagination run wild, daydream, uh, not do any directed motion, and then have bursts of not just exploratory, but purposeful motion. Um, now, as a grown-up academic, how do you uh, incorporate this aesthetic into your research? And more importantly, how do you let other people uh, under your mentorship meander like this? It's quite hard, actually. Uh, this is something I, I struggle with. Um, you know, the, 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 the structure of academic science where you the PI comes up with an idea maybe and writes a grant proposal and gets money to do that thing and then now that you've got money you go find somebody to do it um, that's quite antithetical to the kind of freedom you described which I think is the freedom people need to become um, really first-rate scientists you need to learn how to smell what's interesting you need to explore things you need to fail as was mentioned earlier uh, before. And um, that doesn't work when one has uh, clear goals in mind. And so much of my sort of experience and career as a PI has been, um, in some sense, a struggle against the funding mechanism <laughs> mechanisms that are in play in order to make space and sort of take the stress for four people in my group who want to go do something that we don't have funding for. Um, I think almost all the really good research in my group, we did not have funding for, or we misused funding for. On that very inspiring note, <laughs> thank you so much again uh, for a very, very uh, exciting and inspiring talk.